Welcome to Cool Church, where cool just isn't a name, it stands for created out of love. Because we believe that you were created for love and by love, and that means that we love you. My name is Rick, and I'm a pastor here on staff, and I just want to take the time to say thank you for joining us today. If this is your first time, we want to get connected with you and put some resources in your hand. All you need to do is simply text the words, we are cool, to 94000. That's we are cool to 94000 and we can resource you, or you can simply download our Cool Church app. Cool Church app is packed with resources to help you stay up to date with the life of our church. There's ways to give, you can watch past sermons, you can get connected. There's also a Bible so you can follow along in our Bible plan. We encourage you to download the app to stay up to date with everything happening in the life of our church. Family, we're so excited. It is Welcome Home Sunday, where we officially reopen our Fountain Campus location. That's right, we are one church with three locations, here online at Miramar High and at our Fountain Campus. And it's been a long summer of renovations, but we're officially ready to reopen our broadcast campus, and it is gonna be amazing. As always, we love to preach with the preacher, even online. So we wanna see you be engaged in the chat, dropping emojis, comments, whatever you wanna do, we wanna hear from you. I look forward to seeing you in the chat. I got a message that's on my heart. I've been preaching out the book of Joshua since I got back from sabbatical. And can we give it up for Pastor Rick, our online campus pastor? Didn't he preach a great message last week? Woo! He talked about identity. Oh, man, I, I, I feel like this is the perfect message to piggyback off of what he was saying. If you got your Bibles, I want you to turn to Joshua chapter 3. Joshua chapter 3. And we're going to read verses 1 through 5. If you don't have your Bible, it should come up on the big Bible behind me up there on the screen. Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Read something like this. Early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim. No, I did not curse. Okay. <laughs> you can laugh in church. It's okay. And went to the Jordan, where they camped before crossing over. Somebody say crossing over. Mm -hmm. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. That's important. Then you will know which way to go, since you have never been this way before. But... Keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Verse 5, this is my favorite. Underline this. This is great because this is where we're going to land today. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. Look at your neighbor and say, consecrate yourself. Tell the neighbor say, consecrate yourself. Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things things among you. If you believe that, say amen. Today on this Welcome Home Sunday, that's what we call it. I'm entitled the message this. You ready? Crossroads. Crossroads. See you at the crossroads so you won't be lonely. Y'all ain't saved. Y'all shouldn't have sung that. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Crossroad. And I'm going to miss everybody. Sorry. <laughs> Y'all, let's pray. Oh, Lord, God, we need help today. Father God, I thank you. I thank you because you are great and worthy to be praised. Lord, thank you that before the earth began to spin on its axis, you knew each and every human that was going to be in this place today. God, may I lie down as you rise up. Don't let these words be my own, but let them come directly from your throne room of grace. God, open hearts, minds, and ears to be open and receptive to a word that will always and only be about Jesus. God, I pray I pray that the one that needs to hear this word, the one that needs it the most will receive something, will be introduced to you or reintroduced to you in a fresh, new way. I pray that somebody needs Jesus by the time this is all said and done. But lastly, I pray that God, for the person that's at the crossroad, that's at a place where they see what you have in front of them and they don't know what to do, they're thinking about going back, I pray. God, that they will keep their eyes fixed and focused on you, and you will be a 
lamp into their feet, a light into their path, and give them the guidance and direction that they need to keep moving forward into the promised land. I pray these things today in Jesus' mighty name. And everybody set? Everybody set? Somebody give Jesus one more shout of praise before we get into this word. Come on. Crossroads. So on this, this Sunday, you know, y'all, it's, it's September now. Technically, it's still the summer, but how many of you know, once September hits, man, we start talking about the fall. Like, even so much so, did you know, I saw this report the other day, they have moved pumpkin season earlier this year. So for all the people like Pastor Yari that's addicted, I think she needs to be, like, delivered from her addiction to pumpkin spice lattes. For all of y'all pumpkin spice people, pumpkin season is literally earlier this year. So all the pumpkin flavored donuts and lattes and whatever you want, they, they about to come rushing to the stores right now. We in the fall, I went into Home Depot. We still in September, they had all the Halloween decorations out. Like, so summer is gone in most people's minds. People are back to work, people are back to school. And once you start to get to this point in the year, cause like y'all, let's be real. It feels like 2024 just started, but it's almost over. And at the beginning of the year, we made some resolutions, didn't we? Oh, this going to be my year. I'm going oh, to get in shape. I'm going to lose oh, weight. I'm going to work out. Some of y'all said, I ain't working out. I'm getting on that. Oh, 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 Zambic, <laughs> you know. I got to stop watching TV, man. We made all these decisions, oh, I'm going to be a better this, I'm going to do more, I'm going to read more, I'm going to do that, I'm going to do all these things at the beginning of the year. Now it's September, and you like, ooh, we almost to the end of the year already? And I ain't do the stuff that I said I was going to do, or maybe I'm not as far along as I want it to be. And now because we're coming towards the end of the year, you find yourself at a crossroad because you got to make a decision about how you're going to end this year, because maybe the way your year started is not the way that you saw it going now that you've gotten to this point. You wanted to be at a certain place, and now that we're here and we're almost to the end, you're like, oh, Lord, I, I got to do something. If I want to do the things that I said I was going to do, I have to make a decision. And the reason I keep saying that is because you found yourself at a crossroad. A crossroad is literally defined like this, a point at which a crucial decision must be made that will have far-reaching consequences. You got to a place in life where you're looking around, you got different options, you could go forward, you could go to the left, you can go to the right, you can go back, and you have to make a decision, but you must be mindful because the decision that you make will have far-reaching consequences. You are at a crossroad. Now that I've said that, you got to ask yourself, what crossroads do you face in your life right now? You don't have to answer out loud, but it's, a, it's an honest internal inventory question for you to process as this message goes forward. And, and maybe I, I may say one that, that sounds familiar to you. It may resonate with where you are in life. Some of us, we're at the crossroad, a crossroad in our health. And we're wondering, based upon what the doctor has told us or based upon how we're feeling, should we get the treatment or should we just leave it alone? You've been thugging it out with the pain for so long, you're like, man, should I just keep going here? Or should I risk getting this surgery or risk getting this treatment or risk getting this thing that could make me potentially better or could even make me worse. You are at a crossroad. Maybe you're at a financial crossroad. And now, because your money ain't coming in the way that you want it to come in, or because maybe you had some and now you got none, you got no ends, you are now considering um, other means to make money that you've never considered before. You are at a crossroad. Maybe you're at a crossroad at your job or your business and you know God gave you a God idea, but if you could be honest, man, you bleed money every week. 
You're like, God, you gave me this idea. Why is it not working? And you had a crossroad. Should I stick with it or should I quit? I know you gave it to me, but I don't see the results that I thought I was promised. Should I keep going forward or should I just go back to the nine to five that I had before? Or maybe that's not you. Maybe you had a relational crossroad and you, <laughs> listen, hey, just when I say what I'm about to say, just look forward. <laughs> maybe you had a relational crossroad and you're wondering, should I stay with this person? Or should I try to figure it out on my own? You say, oh, I mean, it was a lot of single people in this room, so y'all figure this out. I ain't got to worry about that crossroad. I'm by myself. <laughs> but maybe you're dating and you look at it, you, you, you're like, uh-huh, pastor, why are you all up in my business? Shut up, he don't know, she don't know. As funny as that may, may be, it doesn't just apply to those relationships. You might be married and thinking the same thing. It's real life. 51% of marriages end in divorce, according to statistics. That's not just outside the church. That's in the church. You may be at that cross road. Or maybe you walked in here today because you saw something online. You saw Eli on Instagram. Or maybe your friend invited you. Or you heard some way, somehow. And you walked up into this church today because you're at a spiritual crossroad. And you're wondering, is this faith stuff real or not? This don't have to be your first time to ask that question, you know. It's folks that have been in the faith forever, and maybe, maybe when you first got in, you saw God working, and now you're at a space in your life where you feel like your faith journey is stagnant, and you don't see God moving the way that you used to. So now you're at this spiritual crossroad wondering, was all this real or was it all just a lie? You found yourself at a spiritual crossroad. No matter what crossroad you may be in, whether I mention it or not, can I assure you right now as a church, we are all at a spiritual crossroad. We are at a crossroad. And here's the truth. We're stepping into a brand new season as a church. We have never done four services before across two campuses. And if I could be honest with you, I know that's nothing in comparison to what God wants to do. But here's the truth. We cannot operate the same way in this season as we did in the last season if we expect God to do a new thing. God says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Can you not perceive it? Like, he's making a way in the wilderness. He's doing things that he has not done before. Sometimes we can get so used to God doing things that we don't even realize he's doing things. You sitting in the fourth service today, and some of us, we just treating it like it's another service. Y'all, you know we sitting in a miracle, right? The fact that there's a whole other campus going right now getting preached to just like this, that's, that's not normal, y'all. The average church in America is under 100 people. We see at least 2,000 a minimum on a week. That's not normal, y'all. I'm, I'm just trying to tell you, don't get used to God doing something. Always be ready for God to do something new. Why? We're at a crossroad, and we got to make a decision who we want to be in this next season. Maybe this message ain't for you. Uh, can, I, can I be honest for a second? It's kind of a selfish message. It's for me. Because you know what? Since the beginning of 2024, God told me, Terrence, son, your life is at a crossroad. And listen, this ain't the popular message to be like, amen, pastor. Maybe you'll feel that way. But here's the truth. Even if you don't get this, the word that's being preached to me today and has been preached to me since 2024 is, Terrence, son, you can't be who you were if you want to get to where God is taking you. You got to be new. There's something about you that has to change. So I'm not preaching this at you. I'm preaching this to myself, and I'm, I'm praying to God that this resonates to somebody. Because the year, the time is getting short. The year is almost over. And if you want to get to where God wants to take you, you cannot be who you've been. You're at a crossroad. A decision has to be made. In this house, if we 
want to embrace all that God has for us. Because we can talk about God getting us a campus, a building in Miramar. But I promise you, a building may be a blessing, but I promise you, it comes with responsibility. It comes with new responsibility, y'all. It ain't just like it happens and life is good. You see, when ownership comes upon you, stewardship has to come upon you. And the way you steward in spaces that are not yours dictate how you steward places that become yours. You cannot be the same person, the same old person in a new season. At the crossroad, something has to change. Something has to change. And I pray I'm not going to yell this. I'm going to tell this. I pray that today's message makes you make a decision about who you are. That's why Pastor Rick's message was so powerful about identity. When you get to the crossroads, you better decide who you want to be and where you want to be, which means, hey, I might say something today, and you may get the revelation based upon that, that no, 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 that church trying to move a little bit too fast for me. This may not be the place. And listen, it, it does not profit me or bless me to say, hey, find somewhere else to be. I'm trying to t let you know off rip, this is not a self-serving message. I'm trying to tell you as a pastor, because I love people, I need you to be where God has called you to be. Don't pull up to the place that's popular just because there's people here. You go to where the Lord is leading you. It may or may not be here, but crowds have never moved me. Christ always moves me. Because I'm going to be my same crazy self, whether it's one of y'all or 1,000. I'm going to make sure the gospel is Delivered. So we all today, from the servant leaders to the staff to the people on this stage to the people in the parking lot and every person here or online that calls themselves home, we are at a crossroad. And I'm asking you as a pastor to make a decision. You want to see God move? Well, you got to do things you've never done before. This season has already, with this church merger and other things, I'm just being transparent, stretched me in ways I never thought I'd have to stretch before. And I'm not mad at the stretch. I'm excited because now I can do things that I've never been able to do before. You must embrace, but you have to make a decision. But regardless, here's the truth. I don't fully know where we're going. What I do know is that we cannot be the same if we want to embrace where it is. We cannot be the same. So here's a few things that I want you to remember when you find yourself at the crossroad, because this ain't going to be the only crossroad season in your life. I promise you, every time God wants to elevate you to a new level, you're going to find yourself at a crossroad. And based upon the verse that I already read to you in Joshua, here's how you can navigate the crossroad. The first thing you have to understand is this. When you find yourself at the crossroad, you got to follow the presence and the priest. You got to follow the presence and the priest. Now, let me give you some context. We've been talking about this story for the last few weeks, so it should be familiar, but if it's your first time, don't, don't be ashamed. That's why I'm a pastor, and I like to explain the Bible to people because that's my job, and the church said. So we're looking at the Israelites. The Israelites were God's chosen people. He got them out of Egypt, but then they were in the wilderness, and because they did not obey God, a journey that should have taken about seven days took them 40 years. They found themselves wandering in the wilderness due to their disobedience. Sidebar, if you want to speed up where God is asking you to go, be obedient to him. So they weren't obedient, and their leader who gets them out of the promised land, Moses, he finally passes away. He dies, and his leadership mantle is given to Joshua, his young apprentice. And Joshua is, is ready, man. He's willing. He's a fiery young leader, and he finds himself on this side of the Jordan River, and he has to get across the Jordan because there's a place called Jericho that he must topple, he must take over. My wife brilliantly preached about it a few weeks back, but you have to go over the river. You got to go through Jericho so you can get to the land of Canaan, which is the promised land. God wanted to get the people out of the wilderness to the promised land. So this is what we pick up in the story. Joshua chapter 3, as the people are at one side of the Jordan River trying to figure out how to get across, Joshua 3, 3 says... Giving orders to the people, when you see, somebody say see. 
the Ark of the Covenant, underline Ark of the Covenant, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and, I love that, that and is important, the Levitical priest, somebody underline Levitical priest, when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you are to move out from the position and follow it. Y'all, that is so, so powerful. I want you to catch it. The word tells us when you see the Ark of the Covenant and the priest, it is time to move. Let me help you to break that down even more. The Ark of the Covenant was the place where the presence of God rested. It was like, a, it was like a, a golden box, and there were articles in there, and there were cherubim on the top of it. You couldn't even touch the ark. The presence of God in the ark was so powerful, man could not fathom it. If he touched it, he would die. And they literally had to have a specialized way with poles so that men could carry the ark at a distance. Because if they got close and they touched the ark, they would die because God's presence was so powerful. I just want somebody to catch this real quick. Back in the Old Testament days, we couldn't get close to the presence of God. But this is why I love Jesus. He dies on the cross. He stretches himself to make a bridge between us and God. So we ain't got to be scared of God's presence anymore. We ain't got to stay away from God's presence. But because of Jesus, he unites us back to God. So now we have relationship with him and we can be close to him again. How many of you thankful you can serve a God that you are close to? Well, back in those days, because they was cutting up, the presence was too powerful for them. So I love this. The Ark of the Covenant was the place where the presence of God was, say presence. And then the Levitical priests, that was the men of God that he had called in order to teach God, God's people God's word and show them God's ways. So you got the presence of God in the Ark and you have the priests. So the word is telling us you must see the presence and the priest and when you see them move, it's time for you to move. When you see the presence and the priest, it's time to move. Now, did I just say when you see the presence move? Did I say that? Did I say when you see the priest move? Did I say that? When you see the presence and the what? That's when you move. The problem is some people only move with the presence and some people only move with the priest. But the word says move with the presence and the priest. Well, why is that important? Let me give you an example of people that move with the presence without the priest. These are these folks, and I love you, but I, I want to help kind of correct some of your theology today, that just say, it's, it's, I'm in a season now where I, I don't do church because it's just me and God. It's you in the presence over here by yourself. Let me ask you, what's the point of the presence if you don't use the presence that is in you to operate in power to bless God's people. Some of us want to get so spiritually fat, we just want God all to ourselves. There's nothing in the Bible that qualifies that. The Bible says don't forsake the gathering in the saints. Why? Because when the presence of God is in you, do you know that when you are a Christian, it is the most selfless thing that you can be? Because once you know Jesus, you know it's your job to tell somebody else about Jesus. Not just through your mouth, through your life. So if you're just sitting over here saying, oh, it's just me and God and my podcast and we're going to stay in this corner. And you're so heavenly minded that you know earthly good and you don't get outside your stinking house and help somebody. There's nothing biblical about that. So these are folks, that I want, this, this is another thing that presence-minded folks do. Presence-minded folks, what happens is when you're all about the presence without the priest, you must understand that the presence needs the priest for the planting. What does that mean? The presence needs the priest for the planting because when the presence falls on a house that the priest is in charge of, then what happens? Then you come into that house and you get what? Planted. Planted. It matters. Why? Because presence-minded people, they're never planted. And what does the Bible say? That those that are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish. Watch this. I got a pool, and I like my pool, but you know what I hate about my pool? I hate cleaning my pool because there's a tree in my backyard, and the tree ain't going nowhere. The tree been there. I ain't mad at the tree. I ain't mad at the tree. You know what I'm mad at? I'm mad at the leaves from the tree. 
The leaves from the tree constantly fall into where? My pool. The tree minding this business. It's growing. It's doing its thing. But then what happens is these leaves continually fall off the tree. When you go after the presence without the priest, you're not a tree. You're a leaf. Well, what does that mean? Let me tell you. Let me show you what it means. Oh, I like this preaching over here. But oh, I like this worship over here. And oh, I like these connect groups over here. And oh, I like, because that's what the leaves do. When the wind blows, they just go wherever they want to go. And it seems like, oh, it's exciting. Oh, they got great stuff at this church. Oh, oh, oh. no, they got great stuff. And that doesn't, you look like, a, you're, just, you're just everywhere. Oh, 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 the boy's cute at this church. Oh, them girls fine at that church. You're just bouncing. You a leaf. While the tree, leaves don't like trees because to the, to the leaf, the tree, that is the, they just stay there all the time. Why they always at that spot? They don't never move. Me, I'm free. I could blow wherever I want to go. And some of you, it ain't even just with the Christian faith. You say, you know what, Christianity is cool, but let, let, me, let me go try this Hinduism real quick. You know what, let me, let me holler at Buddha real quick. You know what, let me get these crystals. You know what, let me dabble in this voodoo. Come on, let me, let, 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 let me, let me, let me dabble in these, in these energies. These, let me, let me, let me float over here to these low vibrations. Oh, let me, let me float over here to these horoscopes. Let me, let me float. You a leaf. It may seem exciting to flutter around from place to place, but you know the biggest difference between a tree and a leaf? A tree may be in one place, but it's alive. A leaf, it may go everywhere, but once it falls off the tree, it's dead. It is dead. Watch this. It is dead and rapidly dying. I've seen leaves. They start out green. You are leaving, you green, you're looking good right now. Keep floating. I've seen leaves that start out green, but after a while, I look in that pool and they are brown. They are wrinkled. They are decrepit. Here's the thing. I would rather be planted and alive than moving and dead. And some of us want to flow from place to place, thing to thing, doctrine to doctrine, song to song. When God says, I'm looking for a people in this season that are willing to be planted. You, need, you can't just have the presence. You need the priest for the planting. The planting. Why? Because what happens is when you are in a God-filled house and there is a priest and a presence, guess what? You have a visionary with a vision that now gives you a mission. So now you are not floating aimlessly. You are attached to something that is bigger than yourself, that is doing things that you could never do by yourself. Could you imagine if Joanne and I was one that was like, let's start a church and not invite anyone. It would be as big as our dining room table, and it would stay that way. But thank God that we said, you know what? We're trying to start this thing. Let's start inviting people to connect to this thing because we know we got the presence. And if we stay connected, we can build roots in communities, and we can change cities, and we can build strong families to build strong futures. And something that started with 12 people around the table sees thousands every single week because we decided to be planted and have presence. And when the presence and the priests get together, we have vision. And when you have vision, you get mission. Some of you looking for purpose, but you can't find purpose because you ain't planted. God has filled you and given you gifts not to sit into the corner, but to get connected to a house of God that is moving things in a city, that is moving things in a nation. Because here's the thing I can guarantee you, we all got gifts, but I guarantee you our gifts are more powerful when we use them together. This is the power of coming together and being planted in the house of God where there is presence. Because here's the thing, you could try to fulfill your mission, but when you get connected with God's mission, you'll never fail. My mission, my personal missions, they fail all the time. God's, he can't fail. All he does is, in the words of the famous theologian and, and, <laughs> and writer, all he does is win, 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 no matter what. Signed, DJ Khaled. I'm glad somebody found that funny. 
<laughs> Watch this. Here's another reason you need to preach, and you can't just have the presence without a priest. You need to preach because at a spiritual crossroad, it can't be overcome by somebody that only operates in the natural. You need somebody that can help. Some of you fighting something that looks physical. You think you fighting a person when it's really a demon in that person. Some of you fighting something in the natural. When re, in the re, let me tell you, everything that happens in the natural has a supernatural connection. And, and some of you have been trying to fight in a way, but you haven't developed your spiritual muscles yet, so you need a priest. You, 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 you need it. You, you, need, you, you need the priest to overcome things that are happening in your life. And here, here's, here's why I know it to be true. When Joshua wants to cross into the promised land, he had all kinds of amazing, gifted, talented people with him. He had engineers. How do I know that? Because God was very specific about how he wanted his tabernacle, his temple to be created. And back then, Honestly, the tabernacle, it looked like a mobile church. It looked like this one. They had to set up, and they had to worship, and then they had to tear down, and then they had to move somewhere else, right? So guess who Joshua had with him to do that? He literally had engineers, people that understood how to build things. But Joshua didn't say, all right, engineers, y'all built the tabernacle. I need you, watch this, I need you to build me a way across this bridge. He didn't do that. He had warriors with him. We know that because they had to fight battles. But he didn't say, I need you to fight me a way across this river. He had artists with him. When you read like, like Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you see all the creative things that God does and how he uses people creatively. If you actually go back and read about the tabernacle, if you see how specific God is with how even the curtains are, the color of the curtains, all the ornaments. I mean, he, he literally anointed artisans with the spirit of creativity to create. So Joshua had artists with him. He didn't say, I need y'all to create me a way across this bridge. He didn't talk to none of them people. You know what he did? He found a priest. I, 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 need, I need faith to get across this bridge. Because all these, all these specialized talents and gifts, they cool, but ain't nothing getting us across this river but faith. You need the priest because the truth of the matter is, and I hope you internalize this in your spirit, some things need to get prayed down before they lay down. Y'all got some Stuff in your life. I've had some stuff in my life that was standing me in my face, looking me in my eye. In the natural, I couldn't fight it. And I needed to connect with the priest because that thing had to be prayed down before it laid down. You need somebody that knows how to fight with you spiritually. And here's the thing about God. He obviously wants you to have his presence but he also has the priest because if you read the Bible from cover to cover, you will find this, that God's plan is always a man or woman. It's always a plan. Well, what are you talking about? Why, why he need a priest? Why can't you? Just? God can do whatever he wants to do. He chooses to use us. And every single thing that he does, you say, what you talking about? Well, Abraham fathered a nation. Moses liberated a nation, and Joshua took that same nation to the promised land. But God just doesn't use a man. I'm saying one man, and I'm being intentional for the chauvinist believers that may be in this room. Y'all need to break them old stereotypes and those dumb habits because God can use whoever he wants to use. He uses women. As a matter of fact, he used Deborah to lead an army because the men were too scared to do it. He uses Esther to save her people from annihilation, and then he uses Ruth to stick next to Naomi's side. And I love this. She becomes the father of a man named Jesse, who then becomes the father of a man named David. And we know about David. David killed giants. He was a man after God's own heart, and his lineage gave way for the lion of the tribe of Judah, and his name was Jesus. One man that would save us all. If you believe it, say amen. God can do anything without us, but he loves to use us to do great things. So when the man 
or a woman of God gets excited about something, the best thing you can do is get behind them. Because I promise you, when there is a priest that is excited, when there is a priest with vision that has the presence of God on them, if you attach yourself to what God is doing in the man or woman of God, if you can make a way for them, I promise you God will start to make a way for you. Some of y'all need to get connected. You need to be planted. You need to be attached to the vision, to the mission. Because once you start doing what God wants to do, once you allow your life to be a part of what God wants it to be a part of, I promise you, you're going to see success in ways that you have never seen before. You're going to see demonic strongholds break down like never before. And things that were giving you resistance in the natural, they're going to have to move out of your way because you got a priest that's praying in the supernatural because when they pray that thing down, it has to lay down. If you believe it, say amen. I love it. Now, what I just preached to you once again can, if being taken in the wrong context, can be used as a manipulative tactic by ministers. Because it's like, Follow me. I'll get you to the promised land. Follow me. Serve me. I, yo, I've seen too much pastoral idolatry. And let me tell you something. I'm, ter- I'm too terrified of God for anybody to worship me. I'm like, if you, hey, if you start to prop me up too high, I'm like, uh-uh, put me down. Because the moment people put you up, that's the same moment they push you off the cliff they put you on. Don't do that with me. I'm not going to preach a self-serving message. Because, yes, you need to follow the presence and the priest, but listen to me. I love you enough to tell you the truth because I've seen too many manipulative ministers out there. And what happens is people, ca- people, oh man, people start to worship them with, with pastoral idolatry and, and then they get up to these heights and when they fall, you know what happens? God's church is hurt. But I, but I believed in them. Don't believe in, don't believe in me, believe in him. Watch this. I'm going to give you the other side of the coin because what me and Pastor Joe don't, listen, mm-mm. I don't want that. I don't want that smoke. I'm from Carroll City. I did not come from heaven. I'm from Carroll City, okay? Jesus came from heaven. I'm from Carroll City. Don't worship me. Watch this. Watch this. I'm going to give you the other side of the coin because I got to be honest. I got to give you both sides. You need the presence and the priest, but never, I mean never, follow a priest without presence. You might be able to get away with being in the presence without the priest, but I told you you still need to be planted, but there is no way. You can get away with following the priest without the presence. There's no way. So I want to answer a very practical question for you because I know some of you probably had this question. How can you tell if a priest has the presence? How can you tell? Watch this simple answer. You got to see how they move. Watch how they move. Oh, okay, that that sounds cute. I might tweet that because it sounds good. I'm going to be more practical about it. Look at what, watch this. This is how you know a good priest too. Look at what the Bible says. Don't look at what I say. Watch what the Bible says. We're going to go a few, for, uh, a few verses down. Joshua 3.13. Watch this. As soon as the priest who carried the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Four verses down. Watch this. Joshua 13, 17, the priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stopped, somebody say stopped, in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while, this is the part I want you to catch, all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Did you notice something in those two verses about the way that the priest moved? Watch, I'm going I'm to I'm show it to you. The first verse says, the priest put their foot in the water and the waters began to part. So what does that tell you? Who was the first people, oh, somebody caught it. Who was the first people to put their foot in the water to cross the Jordan? Who? The priest. The priest put the toe in the water. <sighs> what am I trying to tell you? If you want to know the difference between a priest with presence and a priest without presence, a priest with presence will always go first. They will always go first. The first to cast the vision, 
the first to show you the way, but not just the first to cast the vision. They are the first to cast the vision, and they will take the first step towards the vision. What am I trying to say? I will never ask you to do something that I have not already first done myself. And listen, I ain't got to sit here and talk about all the things that I've done that you will never see and never know about. I know, and I have the confidence, and I can put my head on my pillow at night and, and not be tormented by the fact that I will never, my wife will never, there's not a pastor in this house that will ever ask you to do something that we are not doing ourselves. From tithing to building to praying to being in our word to loving our families. If we ask you to do it, no, it's already been proven in our life. If you believe that, say amen. Never ask you to do. And, and what happens is when you are a manipulative man or woman of God, you will cast a vision and then you will stand back and let the people run after it while you sit back and manage. That's not what the man or woman of God does. When we cast a vision, we say, let me go first so I can show you the way. Because I need you to see, if God could do it for me, guess what? He could do it for you too. But then, here's the second part of it. It says, they go first, but then it says, they stop in the middle. And they stand there. Till when? How long do they stand there? Till the last person gets to the other side. So, I love this because you have to understand, not only will the priest go first, they're going to stand firm. Why? To the last person pass. You know why? Because after we show you the way to go, we got to stand behind you and support you and make sure that you get there. That's what, that's what a pastor, that's what a priest is. And when you look back, when you're looking back at me, I'm like, no, 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 keep your eye on Jesus. Like, I'm, I'm standing here, not for you to pay attention to me. I want to make sure you don't go back to Egypt or the wilderness. I'm trying to get you to the promised land. Keep your eyes fixed and focus on him. So we are here to lead you and we are here to support you on the journey of your life. We go first, but after we show you, we stay in place to make sure that you get where God wants to take you. We stay in position so we can point you in the right direction direction. If you believe that, say amen. Because ultimately, God will never, ever bring you to a crossroad without his priest and his presence in position because people always need to have something to follow and they always need something to lean on. This is the God that we serve. That's why in Psalms 139.5 it says, you go before me and follow me. I love that. And your hand of blessing is on my head. Here's the thing. If you can't feel the presence and the priest fails, you just know, I promise you, there is a God in heaven that says, I go before you and I stand behind you, but I promise you, he's even better than that. God doesn't just go before you and stand behind you. The Bible says that he surrounds you. It also says that he covers you. He puts a heads of protection around you from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet. Just trust that the only reason God puts a priest here because he's trying to put a physical manifestation so that you can see what, what, what real protection, what real covering, what real vision what real leadership looks like but once again even when the priest is acting the fool God is up in heaven saying don't worry son don't worry daughter I'm gonna surround you I'm gonna make sure that no weapon formed against you shall prosper you they'll prosper I'm gonna lead you I'm gonna guide you I'm gonna support you and I'm gonna cover you so that the enemy cannot touch you if you believe it say amen always know always know that ultimately God's people are never stuck at a crossroad if we know what to look for. Follow the presence in the priest. But secondly, you can't just follow the presence in the priest. You got to actually stay in position, y'all. You got to stay in position. Watch Joshua 3, 4. It says, then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. But this is, this is the interesting part. Keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. Why did they have to keep 2,000 cubits of a distance? First of all, 2,000 cubits of a distance translates to 1,000 yards. A football field is 100 yards. So 1,000 yards is a lot bigger than that. If that measurement doesn't help you, it actually is about a half a mile. So God says, I need you to follow the priest in the presence, but I need you to keep about a half a mile distance. Now, why was that? One, one reason, very practical, if you touch the Ark of the Covenant, you would die. Okay, so he's like, 
I, I want you to get to the other side. I don't, I don't want to kill you before you make it to the other side. But the other reason is extremely practical. Why did they need to follow at a distance to go into a new space? Why did they need to follow the prayer? Once again, I told you, God wants you close to him. But there's still a reason that you have to mind your distance as you follow the presence of God. I, I feel like the best way to put it is like, like this. You ever had to um, follow somebody while driving? Okay, good. So you, you're going to get this. Now, we got GPS nowadays, so like I, I don't really think people even really do that anymore. But in the time before G, GPS, and you had to like follow somebody, or like if you didn't follow them, you would legit get lost. Y'all remember those days? So let me, let me, I ain't going to talk about y'all, I'm going to talk about me. I like to drive, how do I say this, um, without getting arrested? Um, I like to drive with the flow of traffic. I'm going to just say it like that. You know, if the traffic going to speed, I just, I match that speed, you know what I'm talking about? So my wife, on the other hand, she does not drive like that. She drives slow. So there are times that my wife has had to lead me to places because I did not know where it was. I was like, all right, bet, I'll just follow you. The problem is I am not a good follower. I'm not a good follower. I'm like riding her bumper the whole time because I'm making sure I don't get lost. But then I get impatient, y'all. I get impatient. You ever following somebody but you try to lead them from the back? <laughs> you know what you do. You slide over into a lane before they do so that they can get over into that lane. It's like, I, I, have, I, have, I have graced you with the ability to get in this lane. Follow me. Flow with me. I have blocked the traffic so you can slide over too. So sometimes I get impatient when I'm trying to follow her. And as she's driving, something happens. She's driving. She's leading. I have no idea where I'm going. I'm flowing into another lane saying, hey, love, come into this lane. She stays in the lane. But when she tries to come over, her lane slows down, and because I'm so close to her, I end up shooting past her. Ever happened to you before? I shoot past her, and now I have to do the thing that I hate to do. Because I don't know where I'm going, guess what I gotta do? Slow down. Not only do I have to slow down, it's annoying to slow down, because now it looks like I can't drive. Because all the people, I'm, sl like, I'm slowing down to a crawl, and it's people zooming around me, he can't drive. Flipping spirit fingers at me on the road. <laughs> Read between the lines, homie. I have to slow down. People going past me. And ultimately, I have to slow down to the point where I get back behind my wife. And I end up in the same spot I was in before I tried to navigate around her. Because I got to a place that I didn't know where I was going, and because of the traffic, I had to slow back down and get back in position. What's that got to do with following the presence? Some of y'all trying to live a life leading God from behind. God's like, I need you to get back in position. Because you think you know where you're going because this looks like a familiar road. But there's a reason I'm staying in this lane that you are not aware of. And because of your impatience, you have slid out of position. Now you have gotten farther than I want you to go before I want you. See, some of you think you experienced a little bit of success and you think I'm going good. Realizing that God was trying to slow you down because he knew if you got that success before you could handle it, you would blow it. He said, slow down. I don't want you to put the cart before the horse. I don't want you to get there too early. There's a reason I'm in this lane that you don't understand. And I need you to stay in position. Because if you stay in position, ultimately, whether I had to slow down or not, I still get where I'm going by following her. Like some of us want to lead God from behind. And he's saying, 
Keep enough distance where you have time to slow down and react. When you ride my bumper and you got to cut over, you make it a dangerous follow. If I make a sharp turn and you too close, you can't make that turn with me. I need you to keep enough distance so you can see where I am going, so you can see where I am leading you and you can follow. But some of us get frustrated by God because we feel like he's moving too slow when he's moving at the perfect pace. What you must understand is this is less about proximity, the proximity of your life to God, and more about the speed of your life with God. You may not get there when you want to, but I promise you when you get there, it's going to be right on time. Because God's never on schedule, but he's always on time. You got to understand, you got to stay in position because at the end of the day, you cannot go where you've never been if you go where you've always gone. So the only way to go to where you've never been is to have a guide. Like as much as I want, as much as I want to believe I know everything, man, don't let pride fool you into thinking you can navigate spaces that only God has been to and you have not. You need God, so you must stay in position. But finally, as the band comes up, you got to prepare for a miracle. And this is where I want to land today. Prepare for a miracle. Joshua 3, 5. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves. That man, if you had any idea how important that was. Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. Consecrate yourselves. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things among you. To navigate the crossroads, we must first follow God's priest and presence. Two, stay in position. And finally, consecrate yourselves in preparation for a miracle. Those people, when they were standing on one side of the Jordan, they had no idea that the priest was going to put their foot in and the waters would split the same way they did with the Red Sea. They had no idea when they got on the other side that the walls of Jericho would fall without a fight. All they had to do was march and shout. That God, God had things prepared for them tomorrow they had no idea about. But in order to get that, you don't get the promise without first being obedient. He said to consecrate yourself. And consecration sounds like a, a, a fancy spiritual word. In the Hebrew, the word is kadesh, and it literally means to set apart, consecrate. If you've never been to church before, you've never heard that word, it literally means to set apart. I'll take it further, to set apart as holy. What's it saying? God is setting you apart as holy, as his special prized possession. When he made you, he broke the mold. There is none like you. He doesn't, listen, God does not want you to be like everybody else. He wants to set you apart. He wants to set you apart for his plan. He wants to set you apart for his purpose. He wants you to set you apart for his vision and his mission. Y'all, as Christian men and women, we are not even of this world. The Bible says we are citizens of heaven, so we should not act like everybody else. I don't care if what everybody else is doing is popular. We don't go with popular. We go with our Lord. We got to be like, how they going to know who we are if we ain't acting different than everybody else? How they going to know we Christians if we so good at fitting in that we're terrible at standing out? We are believers. We are a holy nation, a royal priesthood. We are called to do things in this world that others cannot do because we are set apart. This is why I told you at the beginning, you got to make a decision. You better know who you are in this season before somebody tries to dictate who you are. You better set yourself apart or you find yourself flowing with the current when God wants you to swim upstream. We cannot be like everybody else. In order for them to access the miracle, the Bible said that they had to consecrate themselves. And this would not have been the first time that they heard this. Joshua wasn't the first person to tell the Israelites this. You know who was? Moses. When they were in the wilderness and they got to Mount Sinai, Moses says, hey, God's about to reveal his presence on this mountain. And before he does, Moses, back in Exodus, says, you must consecrate yourselves. Now, I told you what consecration was, but back in those days, 
there were specific steps to consecration, and I want to break them down to you. They're in Exodus 19, verses 10 and 11, and verses 14 through 15. This is, what, this is what Moses told these folks the first time. He said, consecrate yourselves. Watch this. He says, and the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow. Have them wash their clothes. Pause. Outside of consecration, I just think it's a good idea. Wash your clothes. Like, if you like me, when you throw them in the dryer, they be telling you put like one of them downy sheets in that joint. I be taking like a handful, be ten of them. Bam! So I smell like snuggly fresh. Wash your clothes. That's a very specific thing for consecration. Verse 11. And be ready on the third day, because on that day the Lord will come down on the Mount Sinai in the sight of all the people. So he's like, get yourself ready. You're about to see a miracle. You're about to literally see the presence of God. Verse 14, after Moses had gone down the mountain to the people, he consecrated them and they washed their clothes. Then he said, he gives them one more instruction for consecration. He said, prepare yourselves for the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. Hey, this is one of those things, like look at me and like laugh and, and, and agree so you ain't the odd man out when I say what I'm about to say next. We're going to have a whole relationship series next week. I'm going to talk about that stuff more. But outside of consecration, I just think it's a good idea to abstain from sexual. If you ain't married. Yeah, see, the people saying amen, they get it. See, the ones that's quiet, like, well, I got to abstain. I was having fun. I'm just telling I think it's a good idea for your life to abstain until God gives you the right soulmate because some of y'all making soul ties with somebody that is not your soulmate. I'm going to preach all that stuff next week. But that ain't what it, I ain't, it ain't about the sexual relation. Watch this. Watch this. He said, prepare yourselves on the third day. Abstain from sexual relations. That was just a sidebar. So, by reading those verses, there are two clear things that you must do to, to consecrate yourself. Two clear things he told the people. And they were this. You must first wash and abstain. Wash and abstain. They meant something different for the Israelites back in that day. But I think in 2024, this is a prophetic message for us as it pertains to consecration. Because I believe God's calling us as the church in 2024 to consecrate ourselves. And I think he wants all of us to wash and abstain. What does that mean? I got to wash my clothes to get right with the Lord. No, 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 no. The washing of clothes pertains to what God wants you to clean up on the outside. What's that look like? It's those dirty habits that God wants you to wash yourself clean of. But to abstain, that speaks to the things God wants you to stay away from internally that are corrupting your soul. It's those things that are really the root issues. The habits are only symptoms of a real problem. That's a root issue that you cannot run from, you got to deal with. So God in 2024 is calling us to wash and abstain. I'm going to make it a little more practical for you. Here's some scenarios that may pertain to you or if not you, somebody you know. Watch this. You may have to wash the dirty habit of being a hater. But you will have to abstain from the envy that makes you think putting others down is the only way to prop yourself up. You see, you starting to catch it now? Wash and abstain. You may have to wash the dirty habit of gossip. But you may have to abstain from the pride that makes you believe that you have a place in everybody else's business. This ain't the amen uh, part. <laughs> you may have to wash the dirty habit of stealing. But you will have to abstain from the greed that makes you think what you have is not enough. You may have to wash the dirty habit of being messy. You know messy people, they start stuff everywhere. But you will have to abstain from the anger that makes you act without thinking. 
You may have to wash the dirty habits of addiction. Some of you got sexual addictions, you got drug addictions, alcohol addictions, whatever the addiction is, you got to wash yourself from those dirty habits of addiction, but you may have to abstain from ignoring the trauma that caused the addiction. Like, you might need some counseling. You might need, like, we, we, we like, oh, did this person, they body count high, they promiscuous. Well, you don't know the trauma and the abuse that led to them acting that out today. You can have a comment, you can talk to somebody, you, you, like there's things you can do, but you, you got to deal with the core issue is what I'm talking about. You may have to wash the dirty habit you have of doubt, but you're going to have to abstain from the fear that makes you question who God really is today. You got to abstain because God has not given you a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Now that I've explained consecration in the context of washing and abstaining, and now that you know that tomorrow will be better when you consecrate yourself, now that you know that God has a miracle for you on the other side of consecration, I need you all, and I'm not going to yell this, I'm going to tell this so that you hear this. Now you have to ask yourself a very internal heart inventory question. What have you not dealt with that's delaying your miracle. Some of us been praying for stuff for a year, five years, 10 years, 20 years. Why it ain't happen? Because the Bible says it ain't gonna happen till you consecrate yourself. What have you not washed? What have you not abstained from? What have you not dealt with? I don't have the answer to that question for you. I know this, that God's been wrecking me with that question all year long. And yeah, I'm living in miracles, but here's the difference. There's some things I had to wash and abstain from in my life to see those miracles happen. I'm not the same person that I was even yesterday than I am today. Because every day I'm praying what David prayed in Psalms 5110. God created me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. There's some things I know that I got to wash off of me, there's some things I know that I got to abstain from and the, 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 I need to consecrate in order to receive the better tomorrow that the Bible promises. You can't prepare for a miracle if you don't want to first deal with your mess. Because the truth is, too many people want to move of God, but they don't want to first let God move in them. You cannot See the move of God if you do not first let God move in you. You may have to talk to someone. You may have to get some accountability, get in a connect group. You may have to show up to a Bible study. You may have to actually open your Bible and read it even by yourself. You may have to watch some messages. You may have to go to a group where you talk about the addictions and the things and the problems that you have. But what you cannot do is do what you've always done. If you want to be a new person tomorrow, if you want to see a miracle tomorrow, you got to clean up some mess today. Today, for the Bible says in Joshua 3, 5, Joshua told the people as I close, consecrate yourself. For tomorrow, the Lord will do amazing things. What you got to wash? You might have to wash that unforgiveness in you. You walking around mad at somebody that ain't mad at you and they don't even know it. You might have to wash that thing out. You might want to abstain from that pride that has you not being able to forgive somebody. You got to deal with it. Because I promise you that person walking around minding their business, they ain't even thinking about you. And your whole life is a mess because you're always mad at somebody that ain't even realized that they, that they offended you in the first place. There's some things you got to deal with. If you want to see the miracle, if you want a better tomorrow, the Bible says consecrate yourself. Church, hear me when I say we are all at a crossroad, and if we consecrate ourselves, if we wash, if we abstain and commit today, tomorrow, the Bible says, the Lord 
will do amazing things. I'm going to say it again. The Lord will do amazing things. I, I wish somebody else would reach up and grab that promise for your life. The Lord will do amazing things. But you got to do your part. You got to consecrate yourself and the Lord will do amazing things. Y'all, I am more committed now than I have ever been to the future of this house before because at the beginning of 2024, God told me, son, you need to consecrate yourself. And if, if you consecrate yourself, you will see miracles unlike things that you have never seen before. And today we are standing in an altar moment. We are standing on a miracle Sunday. Four services at the same time. The church is continuing to grow. Lives are continuing to be saved. Here's the thing. We built that building over in Miami Gardens as an altar to celebrate everything that had happened before. We've seen hundreds of people get saved this year. We've baptized hundreds of people this year. But guess what? That's only the beginning. I believe God's going to ramp up in this season in the next four months of this year. Tomorrow, we're going to see miracles that we've never seen before because we consecrated ourselves. We made a decision to wash and abstain from the nonsense to say, I'm not going to be a leaf that just grows all over the place. I'm going to be planted in the house of the Lord and I'm going to follow the priest because the priest follows the presence. If you believe it, say amen. Where we're going next as a church must be on the same page with God. You cannot see the miracle if you don't first deal with your mess. What in your life do you need to consecrate so that you can be set apart and holy? Because I don't know about you. I don't always know where I'm going, but I know one thing. I can't stay here. I can't because the Bible promises me a better tomorrow if I make a decision we at the crossroads church what decision are you gonna make you gonna go back to the wilderness or you gonna consecrate yourself in preparation for the promised land I don't know about you I choose I'm never gonna ask you to do something I don't do myself I choose this day to go first I consecrate myself God wash from me any bad habits that I may have, God, help me abstain from those root issues so that I don't keep acting out those same habits. God, create in me a clean heart, oh God. Renew a right spirit within me, and I pray as the priest of this house that as I go, I pray that your house will follow because I don't want to go back where we came from. I want the promise of a better tomorrow. If you believe that, Say amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed. What an amazing word. Many of us find ourselves at a crossroad in life. It's the point where we have to make a decision. And I love that thought because there's always a decision to be made when it comes to the kingdom of God. The decision is, will you choose Jesus or not? And maybe you're hearing this message for the first time you're saying, it sounds nice, but I've never had the opportunity to accept Jesus into my life. I want to give you that opportunity right now. If you want to accept Jesus to your life, the Bible says you need to simply confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, and you too shall be saved. Would you be willing to say this prayer out loud with me? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, I've sinned. I'm not proud of it, but I admit it. I ask that you'll come into my life and be the Lord of my life. Take this sin away. I don't want it anymore. I'm yours, Jesus. I give my life completely to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen, amen, and amen. Hey, if you said that prayer for the first time, I wanna be the first to say welcome to the family of God. You now have a family of believers who have got your back. And most importantly, Jesus has your back because he wants to be in your life, a part of your life, and help you through this life. And we wanna do it too. So all we ask is that you simply text the words cool fam to 94,000. That's C O O L F A M to 94,000. And we can put them resources in your hand, get connected with you. And I personally want to reach out and pray with you. 
Would you do that? Would you text cool fam to 94000? Hey, I hope you enjoyed this service today and I look forward to seeing you next time. So until then, I pray that you live a blessed life. Peace.